stalkers use covertly aggressive techniques to harass and stalk the TI so that it will be hard for the TI to prove what's going on and prevent the audience from realizing what's happening. The covertly aggressive techniques also are used to build anger in the TI. Little annoyances mixed with abusive tactics and harassment are used to build anger. Gang stalkers wait for the anger to build up past the TI's threshold so that the TI can flip out. Then the stalkers try to exploit this moment to get the TI to do something wrong, violent, or incriminating. I gave some tips on how TIs can manage their anger to avoid it building up and to become more aware of covert aggressive tactics. There are two vocabulary words for this episode, prompts and sensitization. A prompt is a cue or assistance to encourage the desired response from an individual. Sensitization is an increase in the response to an innocuous stimulus when the stimulus occurs after a punishing stimulus. All right, let's get started. TIs, it's time to know thy enemy. Stalking involves an abusive relationship that the stalkers try to have with the TI. The following information is commonly used in reference to personal or romantic relationships. However, much of the information applies to gang stalking incidents. In addition, it is not uncommon for bullies and other abusers to have narcissistic personality disorders. The following comes from Narcissistic Personality Disorder by the Mayo Clinic staff, Wikipedia, and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Narcissistic Personality Disorder is a mental disorder in which people have an inflated sense of their own importance and a deep need for admiration. Those with narcissistic personality disorder believe that they're superior to others and have little regard for other people's feelings. But behind this mask of ultra confidence lies a fragile self-esteem vulnerable to the slightest criticism. Narcissistic personality disorder is one of several types of personality disorders. Personality disorders are conditions in which people have traits that cause them to feel and behave in socially distressing ways, limiting their abilities to function in relationships and in other areas of their life, such as work or school. Symptoms Narcissistic personality disorder is characterized by dramatic emotional behavior in the same category as antisocial and borderline personality disorders. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 4th edition, a widely used manual for diagnosing mental disorders, defines narcissistic personality disorder as a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, need for admiration, and lack of empathy beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by five or more of the following. One has a grandiose sense of self-importance, for example, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievements. Two, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Three, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. 4. Requires excessive admiration. 5. Has a sense of entitlement. For example, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment 
or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. Six, is interpersonally exploitative. For example, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Seven, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. Eight, is often envious of others or believe others are envious of him or her. Nine, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. Although some features of narcissistic personality disorder may seem like having confidence or strong self-esteem, it's not the same. Narcissistic personality disorder crosses the border of healthy confidence and self-esteem into thinking so highly of yourself that you put yourself on a pedestal. In contrast, people who have healthy confidence and self-esteem don't value themselves more than they value others. The narcissistic personality disorder could describe the more affluent and prominent members of the gang stalking units and give a clue as to why such persons would be involved in these crimes. Some of the pers believe that they are part of a special group and the participation of prominent members feed the narcissistic's overbearing sense of importance and fantasies of unlimited power. Being able to nominate anyone that displeases him or her, the narcissist can use this to ensure that others cater to his or her sense of entitlement. Those who engage in these activities lack empathy and are unwilling to recognize or identify with the feeling and needs of others. Even those who consider it a harmless prank lack empathy because a prank that doesn't involve members of the group are usually revealed to the person being pranked and that person would usually find it funny too. But there is nothing funny about gang stalking. It is mean spirited acts pretending to be harmless pranks. So, gang stalking units can consist of a mixture of covert aggressives, psychopaths or sociopaths, narcissists, deceived bystanders, and others. Some of the questions that may come into the TI or audience's mind is how could someone do this? which may be followed by the idea that an appeal could be made to the conscience or heart of the gang stalkers to get them to stop. If a gang stalker has any of these disorders, then it is a waste of time to do this and it explains why they just laugh, smile, smirk, or go blank when these type of appeals are used. Please note that in order to give a more accurate account of a mental disorder, a person would have to be directly evaluated by an ethical, licensed mental health professional. Some TIs have been evaluated and misdiagnosed by unethical mental health professionals. There are ethical mental health professionals out there, but a TI has to be careful where he or she seeks a mental evaluation. The information that I am giving you is general. A TI may even have noticed that she or he may have some of the traits that I have described. But of course, the TI isn't a gang stalker. That's because most of these traits can appear occasionally in most people. Just like the prompts that the gang stalkers use are common, but when used or done in a certain way, at a certain frequency, it can become negative or harmful. Even if a TI or member of the audience observes some of these traits in themselves, they may not possess all these traits. A perp may exhibit all, most, or certain combination of these traits, which drives him or her to become a gang stalker. I'm just giving you a basic and general idea of what you're up against. Remember that each campaign is different and may change, but now you have some idea of what you're dealing with and can go from there. A TI needs a basic idea of what the gang stalkers are like. Narcissists and other personality disorders that have abusive tendencies also engage in ambient abuse. The following comes from Malignant Self Love. Narcissism Revisited by Sam Vaknin. Ambient abuse is the steep, subtle, underground currents of maltreatment that sometimes go unnoticed even by the victims themselves until it's too late. 
ambient abuse penetrates and permeates everything, but is difficult to pinpoint and identify. It is ambiguous, atmospheric, diffuse, hence its insidious and pernicious effects. It is by far the most dangerous kind of abuse there is. It is the outcome of fear. Fear of violence, fear of the unknown, fear of the unpredictable, the capricious, and the arbitrary. It is perpetrated by dropping subtle hints, by disorienting, by constant and unnecessary lying, by persistent doubting and demeaning, and by inspiring an air of unmitigated gloom and doom. Ambient abuse, therefore, is the fostering, propagation, and enhancement of an atmosphere of fear, intimidation, instability, unpredictability, and irritation. There are no acts of traceable explicit abuse, nor any manipulative settings of control. Yet the irksome feeling remains a disagreeable foreboding, a premonition, a bad omen. In the long term, such an environment erodes the victim's sense of self-worth and self-esteem. Self-confidence is shaken badly. Often, the victim adopts a paranoid or schizoid stance and thus renders himself or herself exposed even more to criticism and judgment. The roles are thus reversed. The victim is considered mentally deranged and the abuser is considered the suffering soul. There are five categories of ambient abuse and they are often combined in the conduct of a single abuser. 1. Inducing Disorientation the abuser causes the victim to lose faith in her ability to manage and to cope with the world and its demands. She no longer trusts her senses, her skills, her strengths, her friends, her family, and the predictability and benevolence of her environment. The abuser subverts the target's focus by disagreeing with her way of perceiving the world, her judgment, the facts of her existence, by criticizing her incessantly and by offering plausible but specious alternatives. By constantly lying, he blurs the line between reality and nightmare by recurrently disapproving of her choices and actions, the abuser shreds the victim's self-confidence and shatters her self-esteem. By reacting disproportionately to the slightest mistake, he intimidates her to the point of paralysis. To incapacitating. The abuser gradually and surreptitiously takes over functions and chores previously adequately and skillfully performed by the victim. The prey finds itself isolated from the outer world, a hostage to the goodwill or more often ill will of her captor. She is crippled by his encroachment and by the inexorable dissolution of her boundaries and ends up totally dependent on her tormentors' whims and desires, plans and stratagems. Moreover, the abuser engineers impossible, dangerous, unpredictable, unprecedented, or highly specific situations in which he is sorely needed. 
the abuser makes sure that his knowledge, his skills, his connections, or his traits are the only ones applicable and the most useful in the situation that he himself brought. The abuser generates his own indispensability. 3. Shared Psychosis The abuser creates a fantasy world inhabited by the victim and himself and besieged by imaginary enemies. He allocates to the abused the role of defending this invented and unreal universe. She must swear to secrecy, stand by her abuser no matter what, lie, fight, pretend, and do whatever else it takes to preserve this oasis of inanity. Her membership in the abuser's kingdom is cast as a privilege and a prize, but it is not to be taken for granted. She has to work hard to earn her continued affiliation. She is constantly being tested and evaluated. Inevitably, this interminable stress reduces the victim's resistance and her ability to see straight. 4. Abuse of Information from the first moments of an encounter with another person, the abuser is on the ground. He collects information. The more he knows about his potential victim, the better able he is to coerce, manipulate, charm, extort, and convert it to the cause. The abuser does not hesitate to misuse the information he gleans, regardless of its intimate nature or the circumstances in which he obtained it. This is a powerful tool in his armory. 5. Control by Proxy If all else fails, the abuser recruits friends, colleagues, mates, family members, the authorities, institutions, neighbors, the media, teachers, in short, third parties, to do his bidding. He uses them to cajole, coerce, threaten, stalk, offer, retreat, tempt, convince, harass, communicate, and otherwise manipulate his target. He controls these unaware instruments exactly as he plans to control his ultimate prey. He employs the same mechanisms and devices, and he dumps his props unceremoniously when the job is done. Another form of control by proxy is to engineer situations in which abuse is inflicted upon another person. Such carefully crafted scenarios of embarrassment and humiliation provoke social sanctions, condemnation, or even physical punishment against the victim. Society or a social group become the instruments of the abuser. He first provokes the victim into socially unacceptable behavior, then uses society to punish the victim. The last sentence perfectly describes one of the goals of gang stalking. First, provokes the victim into socially unacceptable behavior, then uses society to punish the victim. In the part about a shared psychosis, it is related to what happens to the TI with a few differences. The fantasy world is inhabited by the gang stalkers, their supporters, and the TI, instead of just the victim and the gang stalker. The gang stalkers just build more and more enemies against the TI to make the TI feel that he or she is fighting the world alone. In reality, this crime is secretly happening while the rest of the world continues its routine. In addition, 
The gang stalkers are the ones trying to defend the invented and unreal universe where they secretly stalk and terrorize innocent people. While the TI doesn't have to stand by the abuser because the stalkers thrive on the conflict, the gang stalkers or abusers are the ones who will lie, fight, pretend, and do whatever it takes to preserve their oasis of inanity. I wouldn't call it an oasis for the TIs. The part in the shared psychosis that describes the TI situation well is constantly being tested and evaluated. Inevitably, this interminable stress reduces the victim's resistance and her ability to see straight. The rest is a good description of what happens to the TI, with the exception that there may be more than one person creating the campaign. There are four phases to the cycle of abuse that have an eerie similarity to the gang stalking incidents. The following comes from Cycle of Abuse by Wikipedia. The cycle of abuse is a social cycle theory developed in the 1970s by Lenore Walker to explain patterns of behavior in an abusive relationship. Walker's theory rests on the idea that abusive relationships, once established, are characterized by a predictable, repetitious pattern of abuse, whether emotional, psychological, or physical, with psychological abuse nearly always preceding and accompanying physical abuse. Additionally, Walker suggested that sustained periods of living in such a cycle may lead to learned helplessness and battered person syndrome. 1. Tension Building Phase This phase occurs prior to an overtly abusive act and is characterized by poor communication, passive aggression, rising interpersonal tension, and fear of causing outbursts in one's partner. During this stage, the victims may attempt to modify his or her behavior to avoid triggering their partner's outbursts. A TI can be anywhere, and a gang stalker will come by and just stand near the TI or make frequent rounds at the TI's location. The TI knows that the gang stalker will attempt to agitate him or her in some way, but doesn't know how. The gang stalker may give the stalking prompt and let the tension build. 2. Acting out phase. Characterized by outbursts of violent, abusive incidents. During this stage, the batterer attempts to dominate his or her partner, the victim, with the use of domestic violence. Depending on the campaign, there may or may not be any violence at this point. However, there will usually be some kind of incident, street theater, provoking an argument or making a scene to humiliate, agitate, or elicit a violent response from the TI. Three. Reconciliation or honeymoon phase Characterized by affection, apology, or alternatively ignoring the incident This phase marks an apparent end of violence With assurances that it will never happen again Or that the abuser will do his or her best to change during this stage, the abuser feels overwhelming feelings of remorse and sadness, or at least pretends to. Some abusers walk away from the situation with little comment, but most will eventually shower their victims with love and affection. The abuser may use self-harm or threats of suicide to gain sympathy and or prevent the victim from leaving the relationship. Abusers are frequently so convincing and victims so eager for the relationship to improve that victims who are often worn down and confused by long-standing abuse stay in the relationship. Although it is easy to see the outbursts of the acting out phase as abuse, even the more pleasant behaviors of the honeymoon phase 
rights serve to perpetuate the abuse. At this stage, the gang stalker may apologize, pretend to try to work things out, or walk away with no comment. The goal is to leave the TI agitated. If the TI is really agitated, there will be a flurry of activity where other gang stalkers will come out of nowhere. Some will act as unbiased witnesses and just watch the TI's responses, while the others will try to build on the TI's agitation. The TI may try to ignore the incident, but remember the concept of cumulative anger. The gang stalkers would do things to create a snowball effect for anger until it culminates to the TI losing control in a fit of rage and engaging in socially unacceptable behavior where society is used to punish the victim, or in this case, the TI. The gang stalker's idea would be for the TI to do something to a gang stalker so that they can exert more control over the TI. If the TI lashes out on an audience member, then the gang stalkers will try to offer some support or assistance that will give them some control over the situation. 4. Calm phase. During this phase, which is often considered an element of the honeymoon or reconciliation phase, the relationship is relatively calm and peaceable. However, interpersonal difficulties will inevitably arise, leading again to the tension-building phase. If the gang stalkers don't get the response they want, there should be a calm phase. But there may be interpersonal difficulties if the TI hasn't developed a way to neutralize or prevent these incidents and recover quickly enough to avoid manipulation through cumulative anger. The gang stalkers will continue the cycle daily in an attempt to break the TI down. Remember that this is what is going on in full view of the TI. In the background, the gang stalkers are engaged in smear campaigns, character assassinations, turning people against the TI, trying to ruin the TI's career, trying to get the TI fired or to quit their job in order to increase the TI's stress and isolate them, gaining illegal access to the TI's private information, among other things. So a TI has to deal with this as well as the constant visible harassment. So you're forced into a system of unwanted pursuit? Here's the survival tip. What is the purpose of all the surveillance? To gather information and plan ways to manipulate the TI to behave the way the gang stalkers want. The following comes from Functional Analysis Psychology, Functional Behavior Assessment, FBA, by Wikipedia. Functional assessment of behavior provides hypothesis about the relationships between specific environmental events and behaviors. Decades of research has established that both desirable and undesirable behaviors are learned through interactions with the social and physical environment. FBA is used to identify the type and source of reinforcement for challenging behaviors as the basis for intervention efforts designed to decrease the occurrence of these behaviors. The function of a behavior can be thought of as the purpose a behavior serves for a person. All behaviors serve a purpose. Problem behaviors can serve the following functions for an individual. Access to attention. For example, child throws toy in order to get mom's attention. If this maladaptive behavior results in mom looking at child and giving him lots of attention, even if she say no, he will be more likely to engage in the same behavior in the future to get mom's attention. Access to escape. For example, mom tells the child go clean up and child runs to the kitchen because she or he does not want to complete the task. Access to automatic reinforcement. 
for example, child flaps in order to release some tension she or he is feeling. Access to tangibles such as activities, toys, edibles, etc. For example, child hits mom because she or he wants the toy mom is holding. We can describe behaviors in various ways such as tantrums, non-compliance, inattention, aggression, etc. However, all behaviors can be classified as serving one or more of the functions above. Function is identified in an FBA by identifying the type and source of reinforcement for the behavior of interest. Those reinforcers might be positive or negative social reinforcers provided by someone who interacts with the person or automatic reinforcers produced directly by the behavior itself. Positive reinforcement is social positive reinforcement such as attention, tangible reinforcement, and automatic positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is social negative reinforcement such as escape and automatic negative reinforcement. I want to highlight the example about the child getting access to his mother's attention through maladaptive behavior. If this results in mom looking at the child and giving him lots of attention, even if she's saying no, he will be more likely to engage in the same behavior in the future to get mom's attention. This is similar to the gang stalkers acting out to get the TI's attention. If the TI responds, the stalkers will engage in the same behavior again and again. So the perps are trying to do random things to see which one gets the TI's attention. Behaviors may look different, but can serve the same function. And likewise, behavior that looks the same may serve multiple functions. What the behavior looks like often reveals little useful information about the conditions that account for it. However, identifying the conditions that account for a behavior suggests what conditions need to be altered to change the behavior. Therefore, assessment of function of a behavior can yield useful information with respect to intervention strategies that are likely to be effective. It's said that assessment of function of a behavior can yield useful information with respect to intervention strategies that are likely to be effective. This is important for the TIs to understand, but let's lay the groundwork. It also said that behaviors that look different can serve the same purpose. So the coughing, whistling, honking, and any other gesture that is used all serve the same function. These gestures are not only meant to get the TI's attention. There's more to it than that. The gestures all serve to help gang stalkers identify each other, agitate the TI, get the TI to identify with the gang stalkers and follow their lead, synthesize the TI to the gestures, and to elicit the desired behavior from the TI each time the gesture is used. Now that you know some of the functions of the gang stalker's behavior, you can use this information to develop effective intervention strategies to help you neutralize the harmful effects. In reference to the gang stalkers, they seek to manipulate the TI's behavior in order to get the results that they want. The gang stalkers seek to get the TI to commit suicide, go crazy, commit a violent act, among other things. Anything that the TI does which prevents these results is considered a problem behavior. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you're telling me that some group of people just go around picking others to stalk and do these things to? That's ridiculous. Not really. Protect Life Now has a general information about gang stalking guide that goes into more detail about how targets may be chosen. The link to that guide will be posted. 
Some targets are chosen because they were whistleblowers, filed lawsuits against a business, posed a legal or financial risk to a corporation, reported corruption within the criminal justice system, a divorcee seeking alimony or partial ownership of assets, a bad breakup, unwanted neighbors, were in a business par- partnership that went wrong, had conflicts with other co-workers, had other disputes, rivalries, physical or ethnic differences, or just plain revenge, or maybe the person was just an easy target. There are other reasons why someone may become a target, but once a person is forced into the gang stalker's twisted world, the stalkers try to do things to discredit or silence the person so that no one will believe the person when she or he claims to have been stalked by a group of people. It's not just a group of people walking around pranking others or messing with people's minds. This is serious business, and it's a serious crime committed for real reasons. Indirect FBA. This method uses structured interviews, checklists, rating skills, or questionnaires to obtain information from persons who are familiar with the person exhibiting the behavior in order to identify possible conditions or events in the natural environment that correlate with the problem behavior. They are called indirect because they do not involve direct observation of the behavior, but rather solicit information based on others' recollection of the behavior. Advantages Some can provide a useful source of information in guiding subsequent more objective assessments and contribute to the development of hypotheses about variables that might occasion or maintain the behaviors of concern. Limitations Informants may not have accurate and unbiased recall of behavior and the condition under which it occurred. When the TI's friends, family, associates, co-workers, neighbors, former mates, and ex-friends, as well as others are interviewed, the gang stalkers are using this indirect method. Now, TIs may get a little nervous because sometimes a lot of personal information can be retrieved and it's information that is being used to help form the campaign and manipulate the TI's behavior. But look at the limitation in this method. The people being interviewed may not have accurate and unbiased recall of behavior and the conditions under which it occurred. That works to the TI's advantage because the gang stalkers will understand the TI's behavior only from that person's perspective. And that person's perspective may be different from the TI's perspective. This is a big limitation that can work for a TI. Descriptive FBA. As with functional analysis, descriptive functional behavior assessment utilizes direct observations of behavior. However, unlike functional analysis, observations are made under naturally occurring conditions. Therefore, descriptive assessments involve observation of the problem behavior in relation to events that are not arranged in a systematic manner. There are three variations of descriptive assessment. A, B, C. Antecedent behavior consequence. Continuous recording. Observer records occurrences of targeted behavior and selected environmental events in the natural routine. A, B, C. Narrative recording. Data are collected only when behaviors of interest are observed and the recording encompasses any events that immediately precede and follow the target behavior. Scatter plots. 
a procedure for recording the extent to which a target behavior occurs more often at particular times than others. Before a campaign begins, the gang stalkers try to find out how the TI naturally behaves. The focus is on things that agitate, annoy, disturb, or throw the TI off. So while one perp is distracting or agitating the TI, the others are watching the TI's response. All of them will report the TI's response, including the TI's state before the incident, during the incident, and after the incident. This is done to help design the campaign. Con Conducting an FBA provided the strengths and limitations of the different FBA procedures. FBA can best be viewed as a four-step process. One, the gathering of information via indirect and descriptive assessment. Two, Interpretation of information from indirect and descriptive assessment and formulation of a hypothesis about the purpose of problem behavior. 3. Testing a hypothesis using a functional analysis. 4. Developing intervention options based on the function of problem behavior. The gang stalking incidents are likely designed following this format. You're probably wondering what the problem behavior is that the TIs exhibit. When a TI behaves in a way that the gang stalkers don't like, it's considered a problem behavior. Let's use the Little Albert experiment as an example to illustrate the point. It's not exactly based on FBA, but it gets the point across. The following comes from Little Albert experiment by Wikipedia. Little Albert was the nine-month-old infant that Watson chose from a hospital. He was exposed to a white rabbit, a white rat, a monkey, masks with and without hair, cotton wool, burning newspaper, and a variety of other things for two months without any sort of conditioning. Then, the experiment began by placing Albert on a mattress in the middle of a room. A white laboratory rat was placed near Albert and he was allowed to play with it. At this point, the child showed no fear of the rat. Then Watson would make a loud sound behind Albert's back by striking a suspended steel bar with a hammer when the baby touched the rat. In these occasions, little Albert cried and showed fear as he heard the noise. After this was done several times, Albert became very distressed when the rat was displayed. Albert had associated the white rat with the loud noise and was producing the fearful or emotional response of crying. Little Albert started to generalize his fear response to anything fluffy or white or both. The most unfortunate part of this experiment is that little Albert was not desensitized to his fear. He left the hospital before Watson could do so. A phobia or even a paranoia was induced in little Albert. The gang stalkers used the common gestures and gang stalking incidents to the same effect. The stalker's ambient abuse is like the loud noise that Watson used with little Albert every time the white mouse was present. The little Albert experiment shows that it is possible to deliberately induce mental illness. Now gang stalking goes to the extreme by causing the disturbance daily with multiple people administering the shocks frequently throughout the day. If they are successful, 
they will be able to easily manipulate the TI's actions and could mess with the TI by escalating the abuse until they decide to get the TI locked up in jail or in an institution or to commit suicide. The following comes from What is Psychological Prompting by All Sense. Prompting is a field of psychology concerned with bringing behaviors under control of a discriminative stimulus. After a behavior is brought under stimulus control of the prompt, the prompt must be faded to put the behavior under the control of the discriminative stimulus. There are also stimulus prompts that alter the original stimulus. Verbal prompts involve verbal behavior of another person that gets someone to engage in the desired behavior. For example, let's say a five-year-old child can't make his or her bed. In order to help, you instruct the child verbally to pull the sheets up and tuck them under the edges. Gestural prompts involve someone making motions that help the person learn to complete an action. This would involve you pulling your hands around in the air as if you were making an imaginary bed. Modeling is used when someone cannot figure out how to do the behavior based on verbal or gestural prompts. This would involve making the bed yourself and having the child watch. Physical prompts include physical contact that entices the behavior. For example, if you were to hold the child's hand and make the bed with him or her. There are two types of fading within prompt and across prompt. Fading across prompts is starting off with the most intrusive kind of prompt, physical, and slowly diminishing to a less intrusive prompt, verbal, and then finally not using prompting at all. Fading within prompts involves using one particular kind of prompt and then diminishing the extent to which you use it. The gestural prompts that the gang stalkers use are meant to get the TI to respond erratically, embarrassingly, or insanely each time that the prompts are used. For example, a TI could be enjoying a conversation when a gang stalker passes by and gives the prompt, thereby eliciting the erratic response. To the audience, it will look like the TI is crazy because the prompts are commonplace, but the TI is responding to an actual event. If the TI finds that she or he is responding to the prompts in a way that the gang stalkers want, it is important that she or he doesn't allow those responses to become subconscious because then the TI will respond automatically. That's what the gang stalkers want and that's what the TI must prevent. But is that possible? Can the TI prevent this? Remember that the last sentence in the little Albert paragraph was, the most unfortunate part of this experiment is that little Albert was not desensitized to his fear. He left the hospital before Watson could do so. Before talking about desensitizing, let's explain sensitization. The following comes from sensitization by Kimball. Sensitization is an increase in the response to an innocuous stimulus when that stimulus occurs after a punishing stimulus. An example, when the foot of an animal is gently touched, the animal withdraws its gill for a brief period. However, if preceded by an electrical shock to its tail, the same gentle touch to the foot will elicit a longer period of withdrawal. 
the sensitization response to a single shock dies out after about an hour and returns to baseline after a day. So, it is an example of short-term memory. However, if the animal is sensitized with multiple shocks given over several days, its subsequent response to a gentle touch on the foot is much larger and retained longer. A TI is being sensitized to a neutral stimulus and then conditioned to respond a certain way. Let's elaborate. The following comes from Introduction to Classical Conditioning by Kendra Cherry. The conditioned stimulus is a previously neutral stimulus that after becoming associated with the unconditioned stimulus eventually comes to trigger a conditioned response. Suppose that when you smelled your favorite food, you also heard the sound of a whistle. While the whistle is unrelated to the smell of the food, if the sound of the whistle was paired multiple times with the smell, the sound would eventually trigger the conditioned response. In this case, the sound of the whistle is the conditioned stimulus. The conditioned response is the learned response to the previously neutral stimulus. The gang stalkers will try to condition the TI to their pre-selected stimulus or will study the TI to find a stimulus that already annoys him or her. They use that until they get the TI to think that the gang stalkers are in control. Then the TI will be transitioned to the perp's pre-selected stimulus. For example, one TI told off a gang stalker that made goofy faces and wagged his tongue at her. The perp saw that it agitated her and adopted it as their gestural prompt for her, first using exaggerated versions of it to get her attention, then toning it down or fading it to make it more subtle and common. First, they did something to make her look at them, then lick their lips or smooth their tongue over their mouths to remind her of the goofy face and tongue wagging. In that way, the stimulus became a gestural prompt for the perps to use. They taught the signal to gang stalkers, young and old, male and female. It doesn't have any effect anymore since she desensitized to it, but she finds it interesting that they do it proudly as if it gave them some kind of power over her. At times, she fakes an agitated response just to watch them react as if they just won the Olympics or accomplished some great feat. It appears that the gang stalkers are trying to get universal prompts for all TIs. TIs can prevent this. So let's say that the stimulus is coughing. In the beginning, if a person coughs, a TI may not think much of it. Then, if the gang stalker coughs while using covertly aggressive methods or ambient abuse to intimidate a TI, the TI may just move away from the gang stalker. Note that it said, if the animal is sensitized with multiple shocks given over several days, its subsequent response to a gentle touch on the foot is much larger and is retained longer. Here's how it is applied to gang stalking. The multiple shocks are multiple people repeating the same cough intimidation combo. Instead of the shocks just being given over several days, it is given as much as possible using as many stalkers as possible and in line with a TI's response over several days, months, or years, however long it takes to get the TI to the state that the gang stalkers want. What is meant by the cough intimidation shocks being in line with the TI's response? In one campaign, it seems as if the more agitated the TI appears, the more shocks are given quickly. So, if the TI is having a bad day and is more agitated by the cough intimidation shocks, more gang stalkers will appear in a shorter time frame using the cough intimidation.
intimidation shocks and may include the other shocks, honking, whistling, etc. A TI should observe the gang stalkers in the campaign against them to see how the sensitization and prompts are being used. So the goal is to sensitize the TI to the prompts and use it to manipulate the TI's behavior. A gang stalker wants to be able to agitate the TI on demand. They want an instant, agitated, humiliating, subordinate, or violent response when they cough, beep, make faces, or whatever prompt is used. It's a power play. The great thing about sensitization is that it is possible to desensitize. Here's the information needed to help a TI explore ways to be desensitized to these prompts. In a summary, a TI is being sensitized to a certain thing. Every time the thing is seen or done, a TI is supposed to become angry, feel helpless, demoralized, agitated, insane, depressed, passive, subordinate, lose confidence, or whatever the behavior that the TI think is being evoked. Once the prompts are given, the TI is supposed to remember all the trauma of what happened or is happening during the campaign and be distracted long enough to give gang stalkers an advantage. The gang stalkers mainly rely on the element of surprise and shock value for the bigger attacks. Now TIs have enough information to start exploring ways to desensitize. Don't try to deny or forget what happened or is happening. This is a short-term remedy and should be used sparingly. The key to desensitizing is facing the problem but without getting used to it. Work through any detrimental responses. Remember, I don't give out specific instructions because gang stalkers may be listening and may just work around it. Plus, not all campaigns are the same, although the themes may be similar. So I'm giving enough information to help you find your own solutions and tweak it until it works effectively. Try it and send your feedback to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're still saying that a group of people go around agitating a TI to get them to do ridiculous things or manipulate their behavior so that they could laugh and get the person in a lot of trouble. It's hard to believe. Is this even possible? Have you ever heard of bullying? Have you ever seen anyone being bullied? Yeah, I see the similarities. But do you expect me to believe that adults, professionals, government officials, would really do something like this. You need a lot of people to do this, especially in a short time. Would people actually take time out of their day to, to do this? I know, it's hard to believe at first. It doesn't take a lot of time to participate in gang stalking. The modern technology makes communication efficient and expedient. It's as simple and quick as reading a text message and coughing, honking, or whistling when the person whose picture was posted online or sent in a text is seen. It's like a perverted flash mob. If you don't know what that is, there will be a news article presented about it in TI News. I have also presented documented cases and news reports that show that this type of stalking is happening and has happened. There is a story of the government worker who signed up a colleague for gay magazines and sent it to family and friends in an attempt to embarrass him. There was the other woman who set up websites to defame her colleague, sent nasty letters to the target's kids and potential employers, and spread rumors that the target was a pedophile. There was also the case of the New York City lawyer who was harassed by the police because she made a noise complaint about an illegally zoned bar which had a reputation for being a cop bar. She was sent to Bellevue by the cops for false reasons, endured false arrest, and was in jeopardy of being unlawfully involuntarily committed by a judge. Her superintendent and noisy neighbors were probably involved. Her adversaries were trying to get her committed to prevent or discredit her testimony. Another case was presented of the woman whose home was broken into with stuff moved around. She was followed around and this was after she was told that she would be targeted. There was the man whose neighbors followed him around and ruined his relationship with his family and friends. He developed a paranoia and had to move. It's scary to think that this could happen, but it's happening. 
And yes, something like this can happen on a large scale without the authorities stepping in. This wouldn't be the first time, and that's the topic of FYI. Now it's time for FYI, essential information for TIs. Some find it hard to believe that a large network of people could target and cause so much harm to someone most of them don't even know. But it has been done before. You're about to go back in time to learn about Blacklist, right? Now. I must admit that this gang stalking thing could be hard to grasp in the beginning. TIs often find it hard to explain what is happening to them to the general public. The general public wonders if it's possible. Has this ever happened before? And the answer is yes, it is possible and it has happened before. I mentioned in previous episodes that gang stalking is nothing new. It's just a new take on horrible old activities. History repeats itself because those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. Those two quotes make a profound sentence. Let's take a look at some of the ingredients of gang stalking. TIs are put on a list and may have difficulty finding work while enduring a lot of public defamation and harassment. Sounds similar to the Hollywood blacklist during the late 1940s. We have reviewed some of the psychology behind gang stalking. It's all based on current gang stalking activities. However, the general public may want to know if this has worked before. Can all this be put into organized harassment that causes all these problems? Short answer, yes. Long answer, coming up. First, I must make it clear that the following is just to illustrate that gang stalking activities consist of things that have been done before and have been documented. Protect Life Now has no political leanings and nothing against Hollywood. This is being used in a strictly historical context. Don't be frightened with all the mentions of communism, McCarthyism, and government agencies. That's not the point of using these excerpts. Just pay attention to what was done and how this was done. Let's get started with an overview. The following comes from Hollywood Blacklist by Wikipedia. The Hollywood Blacklist was the mid-20th century list of screenwriters, actors, directors, musicians, and other U.S. entertainment professionals who were denied employment in the field because of their political beliefs or associations, real or suspected. Artists were barred from work on the basis of their alleged membership in or sympathy towards the American Communist Party, involvement in liberal or humanitarian political causes that enforcers of the blacklist associated with communism and or refusal to assist investigations into Communist Party activities. Some were blacklisted merely because their names came up at the wrong place and time. Even during the period of its strictest enforcement, the late 1940s through the late 1950s, the blacklist was rarely made explicit and verifiable. But it caused direct damage to the careers of scores of American artists, often made a portrayal of friendship, not to mention principle, the price for a livelihood, and promoted ideological censorship across the entire industry. In October 1947, a number of persons working in the Hollywood film industry were summoned to appear before the House Committee on Un-American Activities, which had declared its intention to investigate whether communist agents and sympathizers had been surreptitiously planting propaganda in U.S. films. 
adversaries of HUAC, such as a lawyer who defended some of the Hollywood Ted in front of the committee in 1947, were labeled as communist sympathizers or subversives and targeted for investigation themselves. Throughout the 1950s, the FBI tapped the lawyer's phones, opened his mail, and placed him under continuous surveillance. As a result, he lost most of his clients and unable to cope with the stress of ceaseless harassment, committed suicide in 1959. The HUAC investigation also effectively destroyed families. A screenwriter, after a brief period on the blacklist, became a friendly witness and dumped his wife, who refused to name names. After divorcing his wife, he took the couple's young son as well. The wife succumbed to alcoholism and died of a pulmonary disease at the age of 58. In the description of historians Paul Ball and David Wagner, premature strokes and heart attacks were fairly common among blacklistees, along with heavy drinking as a form of suicide on the installments plan. During this same period, a number of influential newspaper columnists covering the entertainment industry regularly offered up names with the suggestion that they should be added to the blacklist. One actor received an out-of-court settlement to end a 1954 lawsuit against an advertising agency which had ordered him dropped from the lead role in a television series it sponsored. Variety described it as the first industry admission of what has for some time been an open secret that the threat of being labeled a political nonconformist or worse has been used against show business personalities and that a screening system is at work determining actors' availability for roles. A key figure in bringing an end to blacklisting was a host of a radio show. He was the host of an afternoon comedy radio show and a leftist active in his union. He was scrutinized by one of the private firms that examined individuals for signs of communist sympathies and disloyalty. Marked by the group as unfit, he was fired. Almost alone among the many victims of blacklisting, he decided to sue the private firm in 1957. Though the case would drag through the courts for years, the suit itself was an important symbol of the building resistance to the blacklist. The initial cracks in the entertainment industry blacklist were evident on television. In 1957, a blacklisted actor was hired by a well-known director as an associate producer for his anthology series, which was entering its third season on a big network. On November 30th, 1958, a live production of a musical based on short stories written by a then-communist writer appeared with the proper writing credit of a blacklisted writer, along with his literary partner. The following year, a popular actress insisted that a blacklisted composer be hired as musical director for her new series. The first main break in the Hollywood blacklist followed soon after. 
On January 20th, 1960, a director publicly announced that one of the best known members of the Hollywood Ten was the screenwriter for his forthcoming film. Six and a half months later, with the film still to debut, the New York Times announced that the motion picture company would give the blacklisted actor screen credit for his role as writer on another film. A decision a major star is now recognized as largely responsible for. The blacklist was now clearly coming to an end, but its effects would reverberate for years to come. The radio host finally won his lawsuit in 1962. With this court decision, the private blacklisters and those who used them were put on notice that they were legally liable for the professional and financial damage they caused. However, a number of those on the blacklist remained there for an extended period. For instance, one of those actors could not find work in Hollywood until 1965. Some of those who named names argued for years after that they had made an ethically proper decision. Others who gave friendly testimony to HUAC after suffering on the blacklist for a time conceded with remorse that their plan was to name their way back to work. And there were those who were more gravely haunted by the choice they had made. In 1963, an actor declared, I was a rat, a stoolie, and the names I named of those close friends were blacklisted and deprived of their livelihood. Scholars Paul Bull and Dave Wagner state that the actor was widely believed to have drunk himself into a near suicidal depression decades before his 1986 death. There are many books that go into more detail. One book is called Hide in Plain Sight, The Hollywood Blacklistees in Film and Television, 1952-2002, by Paul Bull, spelled B-U-H-L-E, and Dave Wagner. If you read it, please send an email with your thoughts. It doesn't have to be a book review, just thoughts about what happened to the blacklisted performers. It's interesting that HUAC, a government agency, was involved in the blacklisting. I'm not certain who are the people behind the gang stalking units, but wanted to point out the association to show that even though the blacklist included government officials, it still came to an end. Blacklisting participants were exposed and held accountable. The same is true for gang stalking. It will come to an end, and a lot of the stalkers will be held accountable for their participation. Hollywood was not the only one involved in blacklisting people. Other industries were also involved. Now that you got an overview, here is more in-depth information. Some of the previous information will be reviewed, but new information will also be presented. Again, Protect Life Now has nothing against Hollywood and no political leanings. This is being used in a strictly historical context. Don't be frightened with all the mentions of communism, McCarthyism, and government agencies. That's not the point of using these excerpts. Just pay attention to what was done and how this was done. The following comes from Blacklist and Other Economic Sanctions by Ellen Schrecker. The cautious presidents and studio heads who fired and refused to hire political undesirables shared the anti-communist consensus. They were patriotic citizens who, however squeamish they may have been about the methods of McCarthy and the other investigators, agreed that communism threatened the United States and that the crisis engendered by the Cold War necessitated measures that might violate the rights of individuals. By invoking the icon of national security, they were able to give their otherwise embarrassing actions a patina of patriotism. 
Equally pervasive was the belief that communists deserved to be fired because of their alleged duplicity, dogmatism, and disloyalty to their nation and employers. Communists were seen as no longer qualifiable for their jobs, since these disqualifications usually appeared only after the until then qualified individuals were identified by part of the anti-communist network. These rationalizations obviously involved considerable deception and self-deception. There were few legal restraints. The Supreme Court, which initially acquiesced in the firing of unfriendly witnesses and other political dissidents, began to change its position by the mid-1950s. But the reversals were never complete, and they occurred after much of the damage had been done. A few people whose careers had been destroyed by the entertainment industry blacklist tried to sue for damages, but federal judges did not even recognize the existence of the blacklist until the mid-1960s. No doubt because of the glamour of the entertainment industry, the anti-communist firings and subsequent blacklisting of men and women in show business are well known. The movies had been a target of the anti-communist network since the late 1930s. Investigating show business was a sure way to attract publicity. There were plenty of potential witnesses. The film industry had a lively radical community with an active core of some 300 communists. In 1947, the Hollywood 10 hearings precipitated the blacklist. At first, it was not clear that employers would punish unfriendly witnesses. But when the indictment of the 10 showed that the federal government's law enforcement machinery was backing HUAC, the situation changed. At the end of November, the heads of the major studios met at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City and released a statement announcing that they had fired the 10 and would not rehire them until they had recanted and cleared themselves with the committee. Over the next few years, many of the film industry's more prominent leftists found it increasingly harder to get work. By 1951, when HUAC returned to Hollywood to resume the hearings it had begun four years before, the blacklist was in full operation. There was, of course, no official list, and the studios routinely denied that blacklisting occurred. Still, writers stopped getting calls for work. Actors were told they were too good for the part. The rise of television exacerbated the film industry's already serious financial slump and reinforced the major studios' reluctance to offend any segment of their audience. Threats of boycotts terrified the movie makers and their Wall Street backers. Imposing an anti-communist blacklist seemed an obvious way to avoid trouble at the box office for an industry that had, after all, long been subject to considerable self-censorship with regard to sexual as well as political issues. The blacklist spread to the broadcast industry as well. Here, the process became public in June 1950 with the publication of Red Channels, a 213-page compilation of the alleged communist affiliations of 151 actors, writers, musicians, and other radio and television entertainers. The listings in Red Channels were compiled. They were not always accurate but they were devastating. By 1951, the television networks and their sponsors no longer hired anyone whose name was in the book, and the prohibition soon spread to anyone who seemed controversial. A tiny group of true believers enforced the blacklist by deluging networks, advertising agencies, and sponsors with letters and phone calls whenever someone they 
disapproved of got hired. One of the Blacklist's most ardent enforcers was a supermarket owner in Syracuse, New York, who threatened to place signs in his stores warning customers not to buy the products of any company that sponsored a program featuring one of Stalin's little creatures. Although the supermarket owner represented no one but himself and his employees, some of the nation's largest corporations capitulated to his demands. Broadcasters scrambled to ensure that they did not hire the wrong kinds of talent and often enlisted professional anti-communists to check the backgrounds of prospective employees. One of the authors of Red Channels charged $5 a name. One big network inaugurated a loyalty oath and, like the other networks and big advertising agencies, put full-time security officers on its payroll. The criteria for the blacklist varied. People who were cleared by one network or studio were banned by others. Even within a single network or agency, some shows hired performers that other shows refused to touch. The blacklisters' targets extended far beyond the Communist Party and sometimes seemed to encompass almost every liberal in show business. One producer found that a third of the performers he wanted to hire were turned down by his superiors, including an eight-year-old girl. It is not clear exactly why the entertainment industry's blacklist had such a broad reach. Although most of the people affected by it had once been in or near the Communist Party, the blacklist also encompassed some genuine innocents, people who had merely signed letters supporting that the whole of true believers enforced the blacklist by deluging networks, the Hollywood Tents petition for a Supreme Court hearing, or attended popular front gatherings during World War II. No doubt the visibility of the industry played a role, as did the reluctance of studios and networks to become involved in anything that seemed controversial. As one industry executive explained, we are in a business that has to please the customers. That's the main thing we have to do, keep people happy, and to do that, we have to stay out of trouble. Finally, the professional anti-communists seem to have been more directly involved in administering the entertainment industry blacklist than they were with the sanctions in other fields and could thus impose their own more stringent ideological criteria. It was possible to get removed from the blacklist. The clearance procedure was complicated, secretive, and for many people morally repugnant. The people who initiated the blacklist, such as the authors of Red Channels, charged a few hundred dollars to shepherd someone through the process. A loose network of lawyers, gossip columnists, union leaders, and organizations provided similar services. Naming names was required, of course. The better known among them often had to publish articles in a mass circulation magazine explaining how they had been duped by the party and describing its evils. Clarence was not routine. Even people who had no party ties had to write two or three drafts of their letters until they showed the appropriate degree of contrition. The show business people who couldn't or wouldn't clear themselves soon became unemployable and ostracized. Some left the country if they could get passports. Others used subterfuges. Blacklisted writers worked under pseudonyms or hired fronts who were willing to pass off the blacklisties' scripts as their own. It was not a lucrative business. The alias and fronts could not command the fees that the more established blacklisted writers had once earned. Producers knew what was going on and unscrupulous ones took advantage of it. The more principled ones began to chip away at the ban and hire some blacklisted writers. In 1956, the embarrassed silence that accompanied the failure of screenwriter Richard Rich, which was really a front name for one of 
of the Hollywood 10 to claim his Academy Award began the process. By the mid-1960s, some of the blacklisted screenwriters were back in Hollywood. Actors, of course, could not use fronts. Even the most talented of them had a tough time on the blacklist. Broadway, with its smaller clientele, did not let them perform, but work in the legitimate theater was sporadic and much less remunerative than in movies or TV. Ultimately, many of the blacklisted actors had to abandon their careers and to take whatever jobs they could find. More than one blacklistee ended up waiting tables. The blacklist took a personal toll as well. Broken health and broken marriages, even suicides, were not unknown. When the blacklist lifted in the 1960s, its former victims were never able to fully resuscitate their careers. They had simply lost too much time. The entertainment industry's blacklist was the most visible of the economic sections of the McCarthy era, but it was hardly unique. Most of the politically motivated dismissals affected communists and ex-communists and tended to be concentrated in industries where communist-led unions had been active or in sectors of society that harbored the middle-class intellectuals and professionals who had gravitated to the party during the popular front. Steelworkers, teachers, sailors, lawyers, social workers, electricians, journalists, and assembly line workers were all subject to the same kind of political dismissals and prolonged unemployment as show business people, and the experience was just as devastating. There are many other parallels between the Hollywood blacklist and gang stalking, but in the interest of time, those couldn't be presented. The difficulty finding work, being taken advantage of by those who are aware of what's going on, destroyed relationships with friends and family, inducement of mental health issues from the blacklisting activities, public defamation, harassment, etc. Gang stalking is not so strange or impossible after all. In fact, the modern technology makes it easier and more dangerous. Remember, gang stalkers are using these old tactics with a modern twist. So for those who wondered if this was possible and has it happened before, the answer is still yes. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats and turn off or mute your cell phones, pagers, and speakers. The show is about to begin. This street theater comes from New Haven, Connecticut. All right, so check this out. I see these gang stalkers walking around like they got it made. I mean, they act like they're part of a prestigious operation that's supported by some powerful people and no one can mess with them. I'm thinking that these people must get paid big bucks, get jobs easily through their connections or some other benefit to do this nasty stuff. There was one stalker who was on my bus every weekday around 8 o'clock in the morning. He talked about riding the bus to the end, which took about an hour, so I was thinking he's talking to me while he was on his way to work. He liked talking loudly about his personal business, his time in jail, how he's good with everybody, his psychiatric problems, the medication he takes, the girls he got, other people, etc, etc, you know the type. One day, he said something that surprised me. He started to talk about his food stamps and how he needed to talk to his caseworker to keep up his public assistance. I was shocked. Are you kidding me? He's on the bus every morning and he's not going to work. This guy got up that early to stalk me and didn't have a job. I was paying those taxes so that he could live up with public assistance and stalk hardworking people. He should have been using that time to find him a job or do something productive. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with being on public assistance when you need it. It's understandable if TIs are on public assistance because the perps do all they can to drive the TIs to poverty. And other normal people hit hard times, especially during this recession. But this guy was stalking and harassing people while he collected public assistance. That's all kinds of wrong. He needed help all right, but not that kind of help. It would take a lot of money for normal people to ruin an innocent person's life. Even then, many wouldn't do it. Gang stalkers must come cheap. 
I thought the stalkers got taken care of by the more prominent stalkers. They act like they got these special connections and networks that could take them anywhere. I just didn't think it would take them to the welfare line. <laughs> Now it's time for TI News. I'm always looking for news stories about stalking, especially gang stalking. So if you find a news story that appeared in an official news source, please email it to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. So here's the news for today. The following comes from Eartha Kitt by Danny Miller. Kitt's difficult early life in the ghettos of New York and then in London and Paris are well documented in her obituaries her early rise to fame as a dancer in Catherine Dunham's company, playing opposite Orson Welles in a European production of Dr. Forstes, and finally, her breakthrough role on Broadway in New Faces of 1952. She was nominated for a Tony Award for her portrayal of a 15-year-old girl living in the ghetto in Miss Patterson, starred in films opposite Nat King Cole and Sidney Poitier, and became world famous for her sexy nightclub performances. There's much to say about Kit's amazing career, but instead, I want to focus on a pivotal episode in her life that I vividly remember from childhood, when Eartha Kitt went to the White House in 1968 and was condemned for making First Lady Bird Johnson cry. In January 1968, Kit was invited to a luncheon the First Lady was giving that featured a discussion on crime and juvenile delinquency. Always known for speaking her mind, Kit caused a sensation when she challenged Miss Johnson about the effects of the war on young people in America. As the New York Times reported, singer Eartha Kitt stunned fellow guests at a White House luncheon and left Miss Lyndon B. Johnson in tears. Thursday, when she declared angrily that the Vietnam War was causing American youth to rebel in the cities. About 50 white and Negro women invited to the White House to discuss President Johnson's proposal to combat crime in the streets sat at their tables in embarrassed silence as Miss Kitt delivered an emotional tirade against the war. You sent the best of this country off to be shot and maimed, she told her fellow guests. They rebel in the streets. They will take pot and they will get high. They don't want to go to school because they're going to be snatched off from their mothers to be shot in Vietnam. Miss Johnson rose afterward and looked directly at the singer who leaned against the podium in the yellow-walled family dining room. Because there is a war on, and I pray that there will be a just and honest peace that still doesn't give us a free ticket not to try to work for better things such as against crime in the streets, better education, and better health for our people, Miss Johnson said, her voice trembling and tears welling in her eyes. The president had dropped in on the luncheon briefly and answered a pointed question from Miss Kidd, but left before her outburst. Miss Kidd, her eyes flashing in defiance while she puffed on a cigarette and jabbed a finger at her startled audience, said, American youth are angry because their parents are angry because there is a war going on that they don't understand. She told Miss Johnson that youngsters feel alienated because they can't get to you and they can't get to the president, so they rebel in the streets. Many in the crowd sat in stunned silence and then cheered the wife of the governor of New Jersey who rose next to defend the war. Kit probably had no idea that a media frenzy would erupt over her words and that her career would be severely affected. To her credit, the first lady never accused Kit of doing anything wrong, realizing that she may have offended people. Eartha tried to explain herself towards the end of the luncheon. Miss Kit rose during a question and answer period afterward and apologized for speaking up if she had offended the president and his wife. But, she said, turning to the other well-dressed guest, I have to say what is in my heart. She said she had not walked the streets of ghettos as a crusader, as some of the other guests had, but I have lived in the gutters. I'm sorry, Miss Johnson replied. I cannot understand the things that you do. I have not lived with the background that you have. I cannot speak as passionately or as well as you, but I think we have made advances in these things, and we will do more. Still, the irrepressible Kit couldn't stop herself. She continued, We have to realize where the truth really is, she said, pointing her fingers at the guest who sat transfixed. The children of America are not rebelling for no reason. They are not hippies for no reason at all. We don't have what we have on Sunset Boulevard for no reason. They are rebelling against something. There are so many things burning the people of this country, particularly mothers. They feel they are going to raise sons, and I know what it's like, and you have children of your own, Mr. 
Boris Johnson, we raise children and send them to war. She said that today's youth feel there is no need to be a good guy. He would rather go to jail as a bad guy and avoid the draft, she said. They feel that if they have any life, it is best to live because they may not be here tomorrow. Was anybody ever that honest to a president or first lady? The reporters couldn't get out of that room fast enough to file their stories, some of them in support of Eartha's right to speak up, but many highly critical. Editorials condemning the singer appeared around the country, as well as many angry letters. Everyone got into the act, from actress Martha Ray and former child star Shirley Temple Black, who criticized Eartha, to writer Gore Vidal, who praised her. President Johnson's pastor felt it his duty to apologize for Miss Kidd in a publicized telegram sent to the president the next day. I commend you for all the work you have been doing to urge more justice and opportunity, especially for Negroes, and because all the Americans are in a sense a family. I apologize for any member of that family, including Negroes, who are ill-mannered, stupid, and arrogant. Shocked by the negative responses to her comment, Kit was accosted at the airport when she returned to Los Angeles. Arriving from Washington, Miss Kit explained that she had said only what was in my heart and head. People thought I was rude, but there's nothing rude about telling the truth. All those very nice people kept saying very nice things about putting flowers in Harlem and making bigger street lights to keep the city safe, she said. I thought they were avoiding talking about the reason we have problems with crime and the problems with our children. Letters sent to the New York Times about the matter ran the gamut. Many took Kit to the task. Once again, bad taste has been flaunted in the guise of freedom. Eartha Kitt's performance at the White House was unforgivable. The legitimate cause of civil rights and the image of our Negro population is damaged by irresponsible acts like this. Why must the Negro be subjected to and exploited by communists and publicly seeking egotists who will espouse any current cause without knowledge or research or soul searching? Eartha Kitt could not afford to buy the front page publicity that her effrontery reaped. And this. Eartha Kitt said she spoke for millions when she behaved in a rude and stupid manner towards Miss Johnson. She did not speak for anyone except hate-filled, gutless fools. She did not speak for my son in the army, for my daughter who was working hard so her husband could finish college, for me or my husband or our three children. We were all shocked by her unnecessary behavior. She had a tough childhood, so did I, and I am not crying. That meeting wasn't for her to air her crude adjectives and gripes of life. But others supported the star. Three cheers for Eartha Kitt. In a few words, she expressed what is in my heart, and I'm sure many other mothers. Hers, hers must have been the first honest words the White House walls have heard in a long time. Words that were not first edited, programmed, pre-digested, and homogenized before the president heard them. And fie on those who feel they must apologize for her. No apologies necessary as well as this articulate response from a doctor in Philadelphia. Eartha Kitt is to be commended for her courageous and direct speaking to Miss Lyndon Johnson. The Vietnam War is alienating our youth, whether in the streets or on the college campuses. Our young people see our society expending the major portions of its economic resources and many thousands of lives, their lives, to achieve by morally dubious means, questionable political ends. The Vietnam War is preventing desperately needed efforts to solve our grave domestic problems that include the needs up for improved education, better housing, urban renewal, more jobs for the underprivileged, problems which lie at the root of racial tensions. The Johnson administration needs to know that there are many, many people in this country who understand this, who are gravely concerned and who are, yes, angry, because they feel utterly frustrated in their attempts to transmit their concerns to their president and to Congress. For this reason, I applaud Ms. Kitt's plain speaking. The real issue about this incident is not whether Ms. Kitt was discourteous or unpatriotic or publicity seeking. It is whether she was speaking the truth. I believe that she was. As the furor deepened, Kitt got more defensive about her actions. People have the feeling that I yelled and was impolite. That's not true at all. I raised my hand and Ms. Johnson asked me my opinion. I said as unemotionally as possible under the circumstances that we had been hiding our heads in the sand, that we hadn't gotten to the core of the problem of juvenile delinquency. Reality was being overlooked. As a citizen of my country, thank heavens there is a country left that has the guts to let its people say what they think. As an actress, a Negro, whoever, I am entitled to my opinion, particularly when it is asked of me. Following the incident, nervous nightclub owners and producers canceled Kit's contracts. 
our contract with the public, we have to speak out to make those who are responsible more aware of what is happening, where they perhaps cannot see. Particularly someone like myself, who has lived a life of poverty. Kit began a lengthy tour of Europe, but eventually she was able to get gigs in the United States. Although the activist label she never sought stayed with her, she returned to entertaining with her ultra-sexy stage persona. It wasn't until 1975 that she learned, via a front-page story in the New York Times, how she had been closely watched by the CIA. The Central Intelligence Agency compiled a dossier of second-hand gossip about entertainer Eartha Kitt's social life at the request of the Secret Services in 1968, but produced no evidence of foreign intelligence connections. The CIA's report was prompted by Ms. Kitt's criticism of the Vietnam War to Lady Bird Johnson during a White House luncheon on January 18, 1968. Ms. Kitt was depicted in the report as having a very nasty disposition and as being a spoiled child, very crude, and having a vile tongue. Miss Kidd, who was black, was said in the report not to associate with other black persons and to have bragged that she had very little Negro blood. The CIA document noted that Miss Kidd signed an advertisement in support of the late Dr. Martin Luther King's civil rights drive in the South and then observed that a number of persons identified in the past with the Communist Party had also endorsed the ad. Eartha was horrified by the allegations which included charges from the CIA that she was a sadistic nymphomaniac. She spoke out, this is too much, this is more than I can or will take. I am determined to do my part in stopping the gradual erosion of American freedom. If this is not done, the day when the enemies of freedom, be they communists, fascists, or what have you, walk right in and take over our country will come sooner than most of us are inclined to think. As for reports of the CIA's invasion of my right to privacy, I am insulted, disappointed, and annoyed, but I don't find it particularly surprising. This is only one of a number of hardships that I have had to endure since making those remarks in 1968. Following my little talk at the White House, most of my nightclub and hotel engagements in this country were canceled, even though contracts had been entered into. That I should be singled out appears at first glance to be puzzling. Scores of Hollywood television and musical personalities, both American and foreign born, have been far more critical of America's foreign and domestic policies than I have. The difference, of course, is that I am not Barbara Hoer or Jane Fonda or Candace Bergen. Despite the blacklist, she was able not only to survive, but to thrive on 
until the truth was revealed and what she lost was restored. This isn't an official gang stalking case. However, there are videos on the internet where Kit goes into more detail about what happened during the blacklist. Some of the things she described are similar to what TIs currently report. Kit didn't give in to the enormous pressure and showed that besides her talent, she was also a courageous and inspiring woman. Other performers also survived the blacklisting and were able to lead productive lives afterwards. TIs, don't give up. The gang stalkers are in a battle with truth and time. Fortunately, truth and time always win. The following comes from Day of the Smart Mobs by Chris Taylor. If you want to understand the future of political protest or any other grassroots group activity for that matter, consider Eli Pariser, age 22. The New Yorker was barely old enough to hold candles at his parents' vigils during the Gulf War. Now he's the international coordinator of Mulan.org, an anti-war movement that has four paid staff members and no office, but wields enough power to set a major metropolis on high alert. Using nothing more than email and instant messages, Pariser an army of 750,000 protesters to take the streets whenever he chooses, although the dates are decided by an even larger, equally ad hoc international peace network. On February 15th, Pariser's army joined millions of people who demonstrated in cities around the world against the possibility of a war in Iraq. On March 15th, they will do it again. Pariser sits at the nexus of what Howard Rheingold will call a smart mob. Reingold, a veteran technology watcher and well-published futurist, had put his finger on yet another transformative technology. In Smart Mobs, the next social revolution, he describes how large, geographically dispersed groups connected only by thin threads of communication technology, cell phones, text messaging, two-way pagers, emails, websites, can be drawn together at a moment's notice like schools of fish to perform some collective action. Political demonstrations are the classic example, but the action doesn't have to be political or ever to take the streets. More than 400,000 anti-war protesters last Wednesday jammed switchboards in the White House and Congress with a flood of phone calls, faxes, and emails in what was billed as the first nationwide virtual demonstration. On the same day, in Rio de Janeiro, according to Brazilian authorities, a jailed Brazilian drug lord known as Fernandiro Vera riots, bombs, and bus burnings from his prison cell using a smuggled cell phone. The original smart mobs were teenage thumb tribes in Tokyo and Helsinki who punched out short, cheap text messages on primitive cell phones to organize impromptu raves or stalk their favorite celebrities. In Tokyo, crowds of teenage fans would appear as if by magic at subway stops where a rock musician was rumored to be headed. Texting, as this practice is known, spread like the Hong Kong flu, especially in the developing world. In the Philippines, the black-clad crowds that toppled President Joe Estrada in 2001 were summoned into being with a now-famous single line of coded text passed from phone to phone. Go to EDSA, an acronym for a Manila street, where black, spelled B-L-C-K. In Nigeria, the same technology was used to spark anti-Miss World riots that killed hundreds and drove the beauty contest out of Africa. Government institutions may be relatively impervious to smart mob technology, but they are probably not immune. If anyone doubted that a group of people can be assembled in a short time, doubt no more. As you can see, the technology makes it possible to do the impossible. The smart mobs could be used for good, as in the activist case, but it can also be used for bad, as in the case of the drug lord who coordinated riots, bombings, and bus burnings from his jail cell using a single cell phone. Those are feats far more difficult than the ones described in gang stalking. All gang stalkers have to do is send a text with a picture or description of the target and have nearby perps in place to cough, whistle, honk, follow, harass, or whatever else when they see the TI. Again, a small feat compared to what has already been done. The following comes from Time Freezes in Central London. The flash mobbing fraternity strikes again in bustling train station by Zoe McGee. At 6 p.m. Wednesday evening, all was normal at the Liverpool Street train station. 
As soon as the clock struck 6.24, the hustle and bustle of the Liverpool station was disrupted by a statuesque stillness. The station had become the latest target for flash mobbing, an organized routine in which dozens of mostly young people struck and held a pose in absolute silence for four minutes. Office workers keen to get home were forced to weave their way through these living statues. I just love this kind of mischief, a 32-year-old property investor and flash mobber told ABC News. It's just innocent fun, no agenda, no political objective, just people having fun. Some mobbers posed with umbrellas as if they were about to be carried away by the wind. Several flash mobbing couples held a passionate embrace, their lips locked for four minutes. Many went for the classic reading the paper pose, and one couple sat frozen on bikes at the risk of being jostled by hurrying commuters. The flash mob fraternity spreads the word through cyberspace. News of an upcoming event arrives via email, messages sent to social networking sites, or by text messages. Well, it's how fast information spreads. I got one email, then another, and another, said a woman, explaining that she was keen to experience the scene as she had watched an internet video posting of a previous flash mobbing. Other flash mobbers, ABC News approach, were less forthcoming, preferring that the flash mobbing scene remain somewhat shrouded in mystery. None wanted to divulge the identity of the organizers. It's supposed to be a secret, a young girl giggled when asked. Flash mobs have been extremely popular at English train stations. For instance, more than 3,500 people congregated for a silent disco at London Paddington Station on November 30th, 2006. In January 2008, a video showing hundreds of people frozen in time at New York's Grand Central Terminal was posted on YouTube, becoming one of the site's most popular videos. Some participants know exactly what they're involved in. But it's easy to see how audience members can be duped into thinking that they are playing a prank, joke, or just having fun with a target. A person may receive a message to honk, cough, whistle, or do whatever the gang stalking prompt is whenever they see the victim. This seems harmless, so some people may do it without question. It's also easier to understand how kids can be involved in these activities. The gang stalkers are distorting reality for both the audience and the T.I. Here's a tip for the audience. If you're involved in a flash mob or a smart mob, make sure that you are not being used in a gang stalking campaign. After the flash mobs execute these bizarre acts, they usually behave as if nothing happened at all. It's the same thing that TIs have reported about gang stalkers. I'm not saying that flash mobs are responsible for gang stalking. I just want to point out that what the TIs report isn't unusual. for impromptu pillow fights in New York, group disco routines in London, and even a huge snowball fight in Washington. But these so-called flash mobs have taken a more aggressive and raucous turn here as hundreds of teenagers have been converging downtown for a ritual that is part bullying, part running of the bulls. Sprinting down the block, the teenagers sometimes pause to brawl with each other, assault pedestrians, or vandalize property. On Wednesday, the police here said that they had enough. They announced plans to step up enforcement of a curfew already in the books and to tighten it if there's another incident. They added that they planned to hold parents legally responsible for their children's actions. They are also considering making free transit passes for students invalid after 4 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. to limit teenagers' ability to ride downtown. This is bad decision making by a small group of young people who are doing silly but dangerous stuff. Mayor Michael A. Nutter said in an interview Wednesday, we intend to do something about it immediately. Flash mobs are not unique to Philadelphia, but they have been more frequent here than elsewhere. Others that resulted in arrests and injuries have been reported over the past year in Boston, South Orange, New Jersey, and Brooklyn. Philadelphia officials added that they had also begun getting help from the Federal Bureau of Investigations to monitor social media networks, and television and radio stations are helping to recruit hip-hop artists to make public 
service announcements imploring teenagers to end the practice. In the past year, at least four of the flash mobs have broken out in the city, including one on Saturday in which roving teenagers broke into fights, several onlookers were injured, and at least three people were arrested. It was like a tsunami of kids, said a pizza delivery man. He lifted his shirt to show gashes along his back and arm. He also had bruises on his forehead, he said were from kicks and punches he suffered while trying to keep a rowdy crowd from entering the shop where a fight was already underway. By the time you could hear them yelling, they were flooding the streets and the stores and the sidewalks, he said. The ad hoc gangs have scared many pedestrians off the streets. City residents are also starting to complain about the number of unsupervised children and child advocates are asking if there are enough activities to keep young people busy after school. We definitely need more jobs for kids, we need more summer jobs for kids, we need more after school programming, and we need more parent support, said Shelly Yanoff, Executive Director of Public Citizens for Children and Youth, a children's advocacy group in Philadelphia. Ms. Yanoff added that libraries and after school programs had been reduced and a program for youth offenders had been cut sharply. On Friday, officials said two pre teenagers assaulted a woman as part of a violent game called Catch and Wreck, in which children pick out people who appear homeless and then beat them and take any money they have. The police, who say these assaults are unrelated to flash bombs, arrested an 11-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl in the attack. The police said they also plan to charge the boy in an attack on a 73-year-old man who was beaten and robbed in the same area on March 13. The flash mobs were meant for fun and good purposes, but unfortunately, some have taken a sadistic turn. One of the concerns of gang stalking is how easy it is for teenagers to start their own gang stalking units. TIs have noticed teenagers being involved in campaigns. Unfortunately, most teenagers will participate for fun, to willingly go along with friends, or cave in to peer pressure. Remember that the flash mob-like activities are the most visible part of gang stalking, but there are more sadistic tactics used behind the scene to destroy the TI's life. The gang stalking methods are easy to execute. Most of it is based on the same tactics used to cause mischief during the elementary to high school years. But the effects are too serious to be dismissed as silly pranks. That's it for this episode. I gave you the information. Now you decide how to use it. Use what works for you. If you would like to share your stalking story with Tenani, please check out the Protect Life Now's organized harassment video on YouTube or email protectlifenow at yahoo.com for more information. If any gang stalkers disagree with the information presented, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.